Hello everyone. How is everyone doing tonight? Good, I'm glad to hear it. Thank you for being here on this chilly evening. We're really happy to see you all. My name is Julia Ray Hoddenfield. I'm the manager of adult programs here at New Canaan Library. And um, before I go any farther, we all take out our cell phones and make sure that they're all on silent or turned off. I know, it's a little redundant, but I have to say it. Okay, so we are so happy to be partnering with the World Affairs Council of Connecticut for tonight's very special program featuring former ambassador to Vietnam, Ted Osius. Um, ambassador Osius will present his book, Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam. Joining us tonight is um, Jim Himble Hilbolt of New Canaan, who is also on the board of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. So he's gonna come up here and give Give a better introduction for Ambassador Osius. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jim Himbolt. Thank you. On behalf of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, uh, welcome to today's program. Um, I couldn't be more pleased to welcome Ambassador Osius to be our inaugural speaker, speaker in the very first program of the World Affairs Council in Fairfield County for many, many years. Some of you might have been involved in the World Affairs Forum based in Stanford before this evening's program. Uh, the World Affairs Forum and the World Affairs Council have, have joined forces. Um, and as I said, this is a, a very auspicious evening because it's the first event at the new combined organization is hosting in Fairfield County and what better place than New Canaan. As you may know the World Affairs Council of Connecticut is a community focused nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that works to engage our community on important global issues. Uh, the, the council hosts a number of events in addition to events like this including a model UN uh, program up in Hartford and also a global security forum every year. I highly recommend both those programs to you if um, you are eligible for either one. 2024 is the 100th anniversary of the World Affairs Council. For 100 years, the Council has put on programs like this, hosting prime ministers, presidents, and ambassadors like Ambassador Osius from over 100 countries in the course of its history. If you enjoy tonight's program and want to stay involved with the World Affairs Council, we'd love to have you join us as a member. You can use a Q the QR code in your program if you'd like to join or just reach out um, via the online website. A big thank you to the New Canaan Public Library for hosting this event tonight. I can't think of a better venue for an event like this. Um, I, if you're like me, I feel like I'm home. We want you all to feel very comfortable asking questions when we come to that part of the program, and hopefully that the, the uh, orientation of the room will make that possible. There will be microphones handed uh, to you if you have a question later on. A quick um, word on Ambassador Osius's background. You can look at the program and learn all of the details about his incredible background in terms of education and career with the, the State Department. What I want to emphasize is not that, but, but the very bottom of the bio, which lists some of the honors that were granted to the ambassador by the country of Vietnam itself. Notably, an honorary doctorate from Ho Chi Minh City, University of Technology and Education, and even more impressive, uh, the Order of Friendship, which was uh, granted, I guess would be the right word, by the president of Vietnam. Uh, this is the highest honor uh, available for non-Vietnamese citizen. It shows that the the depth of the relationship that Amb Ambassador Osius established with the country of Vietnam shows that when he was there and when he was in his other postings in Southeast Asia, he wasn't just doing his job. He was embedding himself as deeply as he could into the culture and history of the countries that he served in. And that's what leads to the kind of recognition that he got from the government of Vietnam. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Ambassador Osius to come up and some introductory remarks. Thanks very much. Ambassador Osius. Thank you, Jim. I see him coming around there. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you to Julia for providing this fabulous venue and to both of your organizations, uh, the New Canaan Public Library and the World Affairs Council. Um, it, you mentioned it, I, you want this to feel like home. Well, it kind of does to me. Not only am I here with my sister and friends of hers from college, but um, one of my classmates uh, from my college has, has come and a friend since childhood. The, the sister of my, my first love uh, is, is even here. So it really feels like coming home and I had a chance to 
walk around this beautiful, this beautiful place uh, in the hours preceding, and I just I feel really privileged to be here. And I've given uh, a number of talks, but um, uh, it really is meaningful that so many of you have have turned out uh, for this discussion. I'm very, very grateful. So what I'm going to do, the book is uh, the book is really stories. It's a lot of it's stories about people who took great risks to bring two enemies closer together as and make them friends. And these risks were that people took were not without cost. Uh, no one who was part of this story emerged entirely unscathed. It's really, it's not a policy wonk book. If you're looking for that, um, <laughs> this is the wrong one. It's a book of stories about people. Uh, in my view, reconciliation is about people. It's about relationships between people. And I felt compelled uh, to put on paper the stories of these people who had been so brave, who had taken such risks, take two former enemies and make them friends. So I'm going to start with one story, and it's a bipartisan story, I'm happy to say, uh, since we're the, by, uh, hosted by the Bipartisan World Affairs Council. Um, it's a story about a Democrat and a Republican uh, whose friendship made at least part of reconciliation possible. And so this story begins in February 1991, and it was a congressional delegation, a CODEL, in the parlance that was traveling to Kuwait to look at the results of Operation Desert Storm. And seated on this plane, this Air Force plane, um, were two senators uh, from opposite parties who actually didn't really like each other very much. Um, but, uh, but they were, ha by happenstance, seated like this close uh, uh, for this overnight flight to wait. One was a Democrat, John Kerry. Another was a Republican, John McCain. And in the past, John McCain had, uh, had campaigned against Kerry uh, when Kerry ran for Senate. Uh, they were really on different sides of almost every big issue. But there they were on the plane. They were stuck together. So they had kind of had to make the best of it. And so they started a, a conversation that evening on that flight that, as, uh, as my friend John Kerry puts it, lasted for decades. They started with what they had in common. They both served in Vietnam, both suffered in Vietnam. They had very different interpretations of the war. They emerged really, really different worldviews and different explanations for what had gone wrong in the war. But that night, they focused on what had happened and what maybe should happen in the future to bring our two countries closer together. Let me talk first about John McCain. He, in 1967, he, son of an admiral and the grandson of another admiral, was shot down while, while flying an F-4 over Chukbak Lake in the center of Hanoi. And he had been flying this F-4 to bomb an electric plant. And of course, the bombs that were landing on the city of Hanoi were killing a lot of not just the military targets, but people living in their homes, hospitals. And so when he was ejected from the F-4 after it was hit, by the time he was in the air, he'd already broken two arms and a leg. And by the time he hit the water very hard, he was in really bad shape. Now, some people out onto the lake, and they pulled him ashore, but his best interest was not foremost in their mind. He had, after all, been dropping bombs on their city, killing their families and their friends. I mean, it was, very, it was very emotional, I'm sure, for these people to go and find a pilot who'd been wreaking destruction on their city. And they stuck a bayonet into his groin. They uh, broke two of his ribs. They dragged him ashore, and he was in worse shape by the time he got to shore than he had been even when he hit the water. And then he was taken to a place called Hua Law Prison. Hua Law means fiery furnace. We but we know it as the Hanoi Hilton because it's where our, our prisoners of war were kept for so many years. And in Fiery Furnace, uh, uh, John McCain was uh, not treated for his wounds. His, his bones were not set. He was not provided any anesthetic. Uh, and he, sh he got sicker and sicker. His, his fellow prisoners kept him alive, particularly a guy named Rob Craner, who was in the cell next to his. And, uh, and by the time 
time, I guess it was six months later, in June of 1968, by the time he was brought before the warden, he'd shrunk down to about 98 pounds. And his arms were kind of misshapen. Uh, he had trouble walking. Uh, he had trouble keeping food down. Not that there was that much food. But he was in very bad shape. But the warden, by this time, had learned who he was, that he was the son of an admiral and the grandson of an admiral. And his dad was waging war in the Pacific and commanding a lot of the troops that were doing what they were doing in Vietnam. And so the warden said, uh, Lieutenant McCain, you may go free. And McCain said, let me think about it. And he went back to his cell and he talked to his friend, particularly his friend Rob Craner, and he said, you know, if I go out now, I'm violating the military code, the military code, which says first prisoner to go in is the first prisoner who should go out. I can't get in front of everybody else just because of who my dad is. And his friend said, if you don't go, you will die. You're exempt. Tell you there are exemptions to the military code. If you're on the edge of death, you get to go. And so McCain went back to the warden and he said, I can't go. I stay, do what military code says I must do, and I go after all of the prisoners who got here before me go. And the warden said, you think it was bad before? I wish you will wish you had accepted my offer. And they put him in solitary confinement for the next two and a half years. Torture continued, and he survived. So years later, flash forward, I was uh, nominated to be the sixth U.S. ambassador to Vietnam, and I went to his Senate office. There was only one vote that really mattered in that confirmation hearing. John McCain supported me. I would go and be, I would have my dream job, ambassador to Vietnam. And if John McCain opposed me, there was no way I was going. And so I came to his office seeking his vote. In the middle of our discussion, he took me by the arm and he walked me over to wall and he showed me a, a telegram, cable, State Department uh, lingo, and there was a highlighted sentence. The sentence said, Admiral McCain's son was offered the chance to leave Noy Hilton and he declined. I had heard this story that I just related to you. But, and so I wondered, well, why is he telling me about this right now? And only later did it occur to me, he was telling me who he was. He was telling me about the single most important decision he ever made, which was to choose his country and duty over his own life. He did not expect to live, but he, he did what he thought was his duty anyway. I was confirmed with his support. He was very tough on me. Uh, Meg was there. He was, he was tough on me during the, the hearings, but he had a right to be, because he knew that if ambassadors made bad decisions, people died. If they made, made good decisions, people lived. So he, I think he had the right to make the decision about who could go and be ambassador to Vietnam and who would not go. Now, the person who had put me up for that job was John Kerry. I'd known him for some years, knew I spoke Vietnamese. His friend Pete Peterson, the very first U.S. ambassador to Vietnam, also a prisoner of war in Hualo Prison, had recommended me for the job. And, uh, and I was, so I was ended up being supported both by Republicans and Democrats uh, for the position. John Kerry's approach coming out of Vietnam was very different. If you may remember that he took his purple heart, uh, purple hearts, two purple hearts, and and I think the, the silver cross, and he threw them in, uh, cr uh, across the gates of the Pentagon. He, he was an, a very active anti-war prote protester. He was the one who famously said uh, during some s Senate hearings, how are you going to ask somebody to be the last person to die for a mistake? And so the two of them had very different views. And I think John McCain went to his death believing that if we'd only prosecuted the war harder. If we'd been tougher, we could have won. Whereas John, McCar uh, John Kerry had come to a very different conclusion. But on that flight in 1991, they talked about what could be done next. What would be in America's interest? And this is at the end of, uh, uh, you know, this is the end of the beginning of the 90s and end of a period during which Ronald Reagan was president where there were the Rambo film. And there were stories about people who were being held in tiger cages in Southeast Asia. And there was a lot of passion around the issue of those were still considered to be still missing in Vietnam and potential POWs being held in Southeast Asia. And what they said to each other on that flight was, if we could, that no one's being held against his will in Southeast Asia, well, then maybe we could move this relationship. So they set out to do something very difficult, which was to prove a negative, prove that nobody was still being held against his, his will. Held hours and hours and hours of hearings. They went through a million documents. As Kerry tells me, they went literally under the tomb of Ho Chi Minh to look into the archives. Promises from the Vietnamese that the United States could go anywhere at any 
time to follow up any lead, living prisoners of war. And by the end of this, these voluminous hearings, there had been no evidence that anyone was still being held alive against his will. But there were lots of families who had not received any real closure, whose loved ones, the remains of their loved ones were still in Vietnamese soil or under the water. And so they set in process through this a Senate special committee that they'd set up, fullest possible accounting of those lost in a war in history, in the world's history. And in fact, that was something that I then took up as part of my task as ambassador, to continue that process of the fullest possible accounting. Those two people, uh, a Democrat and a Republican, took so much flack. John McCain, who had spent all that time in Hualo prison and had been tortured, was called Manchurian candidate. And veterans threw tomatoes at him and eggs and said, you are a traitor to your country, because he had pushed for a new relationship with Vietnam. Uh, John Kerry took a little less flack, but he still took plenty for what, he, for what he did. It was an act of bravery on both of their parts. It was very de bad for McCain politically. He did it anyway. Because back to what defined him, I think, he chose, instead of his own, what was best for him personally, chose what he thought was best for his country. This book is full of stories of people who took enormous risks to bring our, our two countries together. And I tell the story of Nguyen Katak, the foreign minister of Vietnam. He, he ended up spending five years under house arrest because the Chinese were so mad at him for bringing our two countries together. Uh, I tell the stories of Vietnamese and Americans, some well-known, some not well-known. And then flash forward 30 years, and then we're going to go to uh, Q&A. But I want to give you just a glimpse of what had happened happened after 30, 30 years of this process. Uh, in 2023, May of 2023, no, sorry, March of 2023, I took a business delegation to Hanoi, 52 companies. It was a record number of businesses. At that point, Vietnam was our eighth largest trading. We had gone from about a million dollars in two-way trade when I first went to Vietnam 30 years ago. In 2022, 138 billion. Someone whose math is better than mine told me that was a 246 times times increase. Vietnam is now a middle-income country, lower middle-income, but fast-rising, capita income of about 3500 a year. When I first went there, it was one of the two poorest countries in Asia, with half the population living below the poverty line. Now, it's single digits, maybe six or seven percent live below the poverty line. It's, so it's one, of our, it's one of our key trading partners. Vietnam does more in, uh, in the military realm with the United States than with any other country. They consider, they just elevated the partnership in September to a comprehensive strategic partnership, which in their pantheon, absolute highest level. Only the most trusted partner can be a, com a comprehensive strategic. And, and the list goes on and on. The things that we're doing together in the fields of health, public health, the environment, the two countries have come together as friends. And I think that's, I think it's remarkable. I, th I think it was, uh, it's crucial to, to try to explain, to try to understand why that happened. That's why I had to write, and I'm very grateful to you for, for coming and, and hearing about it. And I think now, Tim and I are gonna talk a little bit, and then we're gonna open it up to questions for everybody. Great comments. Thank you. I want to go back Please. to the beginning of your career um, as a foreign service diplomat. Share with the group, because we do have some youngsters out there, What? how did you first get interested in becoming a diplomat and what were the first steps? Uh, well, my family traveled and when I had, I took a gap year between high school and college, I chose to travel. I raised, I earned some money. Then I went to Israel and I worked on a kibbutz. And then I went to Egypt and Syria and Jordan. And being 19 and you know an American, uh, which of uh, definition means a little bit oblivious, uh, and I, 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 I decided, well, there's this conflict between Arabs and Israelis, and I'm going to fix that. Last <laughs> uh, still needs fixing, but I, I thought it was fascinating to see both Israel and the Arab neighbors, and to study that conflict, and to think about how two different, similar cultures come to such a, a an impasse, and I thought well, I would like to be a diplomat because I do want to help. I do want to make the world better in that way. And then uh, I took the foreign service exam once and I failed it. Then I took it a second time and I failed it. And then I finally passed it on the third time around. And so then I was finally allowed to do this thing that I really wanted to do. Um, I was presented with a choice. You could go back to the Middle East, you speak some Arabic, or you could go to Asia. I thought about it and I was a political officer 
I was assigned the political cone, which means you do a lot of reporting about what's happening. And I thought, well, if I'm in the Middle East, I'll be reporting, remember this is 30 years ago, be reporting on terrorism and oil. And that's pretty grim. I kind of want to report about some good things. In Asia, there are all these good stories. There are these stories of growth and hope, possibility, and I think I'd rather do that. And so I went to the Philippines for my first posting. I never looked back. From then on, it was all Asia, all the time. I'm still working on, on Asia. I felt it was a place where the tectonic plates were still moving and you could make a difference. And happily, I think I've been able to make a difference and I've seen lots of other diplomats who have done so as well. Before you went to Vietnam, you had to learn a language, Vietnamese. Can you share some of your Vietnamese with us in whatever manner you'd like to prove your bona fides? Uh, Chak Chen. That's fabulous, thank you. We have a combination of people here, um, some professionals, some teachers, some corporate, some government folks perhaps. But one of the things that, that's always interested me um, when someone takes on a new job, such as you're posting to Vietnam as the ambassador, is how you form your agenda. Um, and you've mentioned several times today already your determination to make a difference, right? And, and the extent to which you admired other people who sacrificed personally in order to make a difference for their nation. Share with us the process for establishing your agenda as the ambassador? Uh, so you get a lot of training before you go. And I took a course that we fondly called Charm School uh, for new ambassadors. And one of the people who taught us during Charm School was a guy named Bill Byrne, who is now head of the CIA and actually negotiating, trying to negotiate for the release of hostages out of Gaza. Um, and uh, Ambassador Burns said, you don't have that much time. You need to land on the ground knowing what you're going to accomplish in your first hundred days, because that sets the tone for your a good student. I studied hard. I came up with a six-point agenda, six issues I was going to work really hard on. We were going to make a big difference in and and Boy, was I ready by the time I arrived. What I hadn't really thought about was the other side might have an agenda, and it might be just as relevant as my six points. And so the first 100 days were actually kind of surprising. Yes, I was putting in motion all of these streams of action, and, and I had given a big speech about what we wanted to accomplish. I was getting these messages from the Vietnamese kind of ran not counter to my agenda, but were quite different. The Vietnamese, starting with a vice foreign minister who I became my friend and I really grew to trust, saying, there's something really important to us. We want the general secretary of the Communist Party go to the Oval Office. It doesn't really sound like any of my six points, and I'm not sure that it's even necessarily going to work. So besides, that's probably Washington's problem. So I wrote back to Washington and said, yeah, the Vietnamese are saying they want the general secretary to come to the Oval Office, ha <laughs> And uh, the message I got back was, no, that's not going to happen. President receives heads of state. He's a head of a party. By the way, it's the Communist Party. We don't even particularly like it. So, no, he's not going to be invited to the Oval Office. Well, I, so I thought, woohoo, that's not my problem anymore. I kept hearing this from the Vietnamese, and I suddenly realized, actually, it was my problem. There was no one who was going to advocate for this if I didn't. And it was really important to the Vietnamese. And so I, I contacted uh, my, a good friend of mine who's a professor at, at Harvard. And John Kerry trusted, and I said, Tommy, they want General Secretary to go to the Oval Office, and it's really important to them. And he said, terrible idea. This guy was like a, Marxist, a professor of Marxist-Leninist ideology, and they wanted to let him in the Oval Office, and, and Tommy said, that's not just not going to happen. And I worked on him for a while until he finally realized they were really serious about it. He was the hardest of the hardliners in the Politburo, and if he could go, he's going to change everything. And so Tommy helped me convince John Kerry. We went around the system. Uh, Tommy helped me convince John Kerry, who then went around the system the, the national security advisor of the president at the time said, no way, over my dead body, is this going to happen? He went around her, and he talked to the president during one of their weekly lunches, and the president agreed, and she was furious, and she was furious at him, she was furious at me. General Secretary came, and the discussion in the Oval Office was historic. I would say it changed the trajectory of the relationship forever, because by the end of a meeting that had gone twice as long as it was supposed to go, we had done the necessary to bring them into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 
he had what he needed in terms of reassurance that we were not going to try to overthrow him or his government. And from that moment on, we were cooking with gas. We were able to get agreements on the Peace Corps and on more teachers and on environmental collaboration and work together through USAID on the environment. And one thing after another actually led ultimately to a visit by an aircraft carrier. Things that we set in motion with that meeting changed the relationship forever. And uh, just the, I'll close, but, but uh, the general secretary afterwards, he said, he said to me, so how did you think that went? And I said, sir, you used to be a teacher. I would give that an A++. <laughs> it was great. And, and never would I have thought that would be the most significant action I took as ambassador. Thank you. Next question I'd like to ask is, I have to preface it with a comment on the book. One, one of the great things, I, I have read the book, one of the great things about the book, Ambassador, is the way you weave together your personal story and the political story, and the extent to which I think you're very candid about sort of the emotional impact of, um, of events. One of my favorite passages is when you describe the visit of President Obama and the things that went well on that visit, and then some things that didn't go so well on the Vietnamese side. So if you could just share that story and the satisfaction and the disappointment came all at the same time. First, those three days, I was a diplomat for almost 30 years. Those three days when Barack Obama visited were highlight of my career. So it was something I was very excited about. Earlier visit by the general secretary made Obama's visit possible, made it possible to have a really substantive visit by the U.S. president. And so those three days were nominal. And getting into the car, you know, there's the beast, the you know the president's limousine. Sometimes the president, the ambassador in, and sometimes not. And I was like so hoping, you know, I hope he'll let me into the car. And so I get into the car, and I'm so ready. I know, you know, the talking points and the agenda. I'm just, you know, thinking those are going to be the questions. He knew all that. I had already absorbed everything in his briefing book. He had studied. He was prepared. He knew who he was going to see. He knew what to say. He didn't want questions about, about the meeting agenda. He wanted to get under the skin. So he started asking me questions about what's the relationship between people and the, what are the desires of young people and aspirations of young people. Are there people moving from rurb, uh, rural areas into urban areas and what question is that creating? And then he started asking me questions that uh, Vietnam to Indonesia. Now luckily I'd just come from Indonesia where I'd been number two. So I was able to meet him as he was uh, as he was talking on on those questions, he he understood Indonesia very well, and he was new to Vietnam. And then he threw me a soft. He said, "So Ted, uh, tell me about your family." I read my bio, and I said, "Well, Mr. President, um, uh, my husband's black, and my two children are Mexican American, like a Benetton ad." <laughs> he said, "So why don't you come by? Bring bring your kids over and and see me." And and we did. And and then and then something went really wrong, and that's the other side of this. So this was like a Hi, everything was exciting and wonderful. But I'd also set up a meeting for the president, civil society rep. Just as the president was about to land, I started getting reports that the people he was going to meet quietly, discreetly shuttled out of the city, miles and miles away, and dropped off in the middle of nowhere. People that the president was going to meet. And I, I, I kind of couldn't believe it. I went to uh, Secretary Kerry and said, I had a deal. They were going to allow this meeting to go forward as long as I told them who would be in it. No, no one in it had been convicted of a crime. That was the deal. And Mr. Secretary, what do you do when someone has betrayed you? I was I was furious at this point. The secretary said, happens to, me, happens to me all the time. It happened yesterday. <laughs> and he told me the situation in Af about Afghanistan. Yeah, I get betrayed all the time. But here's the thing. Don't burn bridges. Don't slap him on the back. Don't burn bridges. And then he proceeded to meet with the foreign minister. And he said, you know, Cuba, the president got to meet with representatives of civil society. Would you like him to go out and speak to the press and say, you are way more repressive than Cuba? The ministers heard. And then instructions went out. And some of those people who'd been left by the side of the road were brought back into Hanoi. And we ended up having the round table with civil society after all, though I think two of them never made it back. Not that they were killed, but that they didn't make it back in time. Um, so, it, and it was, and the president was very zen about it. I felt terrible. I said, you know, Mr. President, I, I set this up and I believed and feel that I had together. And he said, hey, this is new to them. This is new. They've never had to do anything like this before. It's okay. And it went forward. I have one more question and then please prepare your questions because we'll have two mics that are ready to be handed out. Fast forward fully to the present day. There's a, a lot of violence and conflict out in the world. Um, your book is about nothing is impossible. 
and um, I'm wondering if there are some lessons learned from your experience in bringing two enemies together that you think might have application to what's happening in the Middle East, in the Ukraine, or any of the other hotspots of the world. Uh, first, I anchor all of my analysis of Vietnam in its historic context. And so, first, a disclaimer, I don't know as much about Ukraine or, or Gaza as I know about. I'll still hazard uh, a few thoughts. Um, let's start with Ukraine. I think one of the lessons of Vietnam or the United States was that when your adversary wraps himself in the cloak of nationalism, it's hard to win. Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist above all, and once he had convinced the majority of Vietnamese that he spoke for the aspirations of the Vietnamese and that the government that we supported did not, he had lost. And I think Vladimir Putin did not, un not absorb that lesson. That in the end, Ho Chi Minh said, in the end, we could lose nine men for every one that you, you lose, and still, we will win, you will lose. We will fight to the last. I think that's the by the way Ukrainians approach this. They will keep fighting. Maybe that Vladimir Putin will take part of the country. May, he'll inflict terrible damage. And in the end, they will not give up. And the, what we've seen is incredible bravery. And I think he absolutely underestimated the power of, of nationalism and fighting for your home, fighting on your home soil for land of your ancestors. He did not, did not get that. So I don't know where, how it will go, but he didn't absorb the, the key lesson of Vietnam. Now, when it comes to Middle East, only thing I can think of, and this is really to pull kind of above the immediate fray, the big lessons of reconciliation, I think, were first you have to show respect. Respect those whose views or culture or language history is different from yours. And then you have to build trust, and that's usually done person by person. And then you start doing things together, and that builds more trust. And it's that trust that eventually leads to partnership. That's really hard to think about in the Middle East context. Trust is very hard to think about. So what ha it has to begin by identifying would make sense is in the interest of those parties that would allow them to lower the level of hostility and start talking about where there might be some common some common goals or common humanity. And I think what they're tr the administration is trying to do right now, and I don't understand it fully, they're trying to appeal to the Israelis by saying, look, there's this possibility of a relationship with Saudi Arabia. What do the Israelis want? They want security. And if there's a possibility of having a more peaceful relationship with their neighbors, well, then they might lower the hostilities long enough for there to be some, at least some dialogue. Because, you know, if you don't have dialogue, there's no chance you're going to move anything forward. And so I, I, I think it's a terrible, terrible situation. Uh, but I think you still have to remember if you you got to talk, got to listen to the other side, you've got to try to under, understand the other side. You even have to show respect to the other side or you don't have a chance of moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much <laughs> for such a beautiful Thank presentation. Thank you.